All right, what's going on you guys? My name's Isaac. I am a pharmacy student at U of T and today I'm here to bring you the good news about treatments for male pattern hair loss. Now, I know that this is a subject that men generally don't like to talk about. If you're someone who's losing your hair, the general advice is to shave your head and be done with it. However, believe it or not, many men, thousands of men, myself included, have their hair because of drugs that we take. And today I'm going to be talking about a few of these drugs. More specifically, I'm going to be talking about minoxidil and finasteride. I know that there are other drugs that are available, but these two are supported by the most scientific evidence and many of the other drugs are simply snake oil. Your friend Jim, who uses a mix of magic crystals and essential oils, maybe those treatments work for him, but there's no magic crystal randomized control trial and for that reason, there's no way to predict if these methods will work for you. Anyways, the majority of the information that I'm presenting comes from the European Dermatology Forum guideline. I personally believe that this is one of the most up-to-date and comprehensive guidelines for treating male pattern hair loss and I've linked it below. In terms of video formatting, first I'm going to be talking about male pattern hair loss as a condition and how it presents. Then I'm going to talk about each treatment in terms of safety and efficacy. That's how well it works and what kind of side effects do they cause. And lastly, I'm going to be talking about practical aspects. Things like how much does it cost? Do you need a doctor's prescription? Where can you get them from? These types of questions. Anyways, I hope that you find this video informative. I hope that you learned something new. And if you're a man who is currently losing your hair, I hope that this video helps you make the right decision for you about whether or not to start treatment. So without further ado, so without further ado let's get started. Male pattern hair loss is believed to be caused by a mix of hormone and genetic factors. There's a hormone called DHT or dihydrotestosterone in particular, which is believed to play a major role. And I'll talk about this in a bit more detail when I talk about finasteride. In the past, scientists believe that male pattern hair loss came from your mom side of the family. Current thinking is that it's a little bit more complicated. There are many genes involved and pattern hair loss can come from either parent. Male pattern hair loss generally presents as recession at the temples or thinning at the crown of the head. Either of these symptoms can happen on their own or together. However, if your hair loss is patchy, if it is rapid in onset, if it is accompanied by redness and itchiness, or if it is happening all over your body, it might be something a little bit more serious and you should consider talking to a doctor. Minoxidil is available over the counter as a liquid or a foam. Minoxidil is generally recommended as a first line treatment for pattern hair loss due to an excellent safety profile. Minoxidil is believed to stimulate hair growth by widening blood vessels and increasing the flow of nutrients and blood to the scalp. However, the exact mechanism is a little bit more complicated and it's not completely understood. Countless studies show that minoxidil is very effective both at preventing further hair loss and increasing hair growth. The, ref the studies that I've referenced looked at about 48 different minoxidil studies. And they found on average minoxidil increased hair growth at the vertex of the head both at 6 months and at 12 months from treatment start. For comparison, the average density of hairs on a human scalp is 200 to 300 hairs per square centimeter, so you can see that these results are fairly significant. However, one of the major limitations of these studies is that most of them looked at the hairs on the vertex and not at the front of the head. To address these limitations, the guideline authors looked at two different studies. The first study was done by Hillman and colleagues. They found that minoxidil increased hair growth both at the front of the scalp and at the vertex of the scalp at 16 weeks from treatment start. Unfortunately, by 24 weeks, these increased hair counts were no longer statistically significant. They were still better than placebo, they just weren't enough to be significant. Another study by Canty and colleagues found that minoxidil improved hair growth at both the front of the scalp and at the vertex of the scalp at 52 weeks. However, again, unfortunately, by 104 weeks, they found that these hair counts were no longer statistically significant. For me, these results imply two different things about minoxidil. Number one, you can probably get the same amount of growth at the front of your head that you can get at the back of your head. And two, although you might get some growth initially, the results that you get will probably not be very sustainable. However, you should be able to keep what you have at baseline. All right, minoxidil is available in two different strengths. We've got the 2% strength and the 5% strength. Which strength should you pick? 
So the guideline that I've referenced, they looked at about two different studies that looked at this question. They both found that the 5% strength was more effective than the 2% strength, so I would probably go with the 5% strength. Minoxidil is also available as a liquid or a foam. Which one should you choose? Both formulations are equally effective, so this one comes down to personal preference. I personally find that the foam is more cosmetically pleasing, it keeps your hair dry and held in place, whereas the liquid can make your hair look a little bit wet and greasy. However, if you are like myself and you have long to medium length hair, you might find that the liquid is easier to apply because it comes with a dropper, whereas the foam can get stuck in your hair. Okay, so let's talk about side effects. Like I said earlier, minoxidil is very safe. Since it's applied to the scalp, very little of the medication can get into your bloodstream and can circulate around your body. However, during the first couple months of treatment, minoxidil often causes some shedding. The thought behind this is that your smaller hairs need to fall out to make way for growth of larger hairs. Another side effect that minoxidil can also cause is increased hair growth wherever it gets to. So if you're applying minoxidil to your face or to your nose or to your cheeks by accident, you might notice some increased hair growth in those areas. Lastly, minoxidil can cause some skin irritation, some redness, some itchiness, those types of symptoms. Okay, so let's talk about pricing and availability. You can find minoxidil at most pharmacies and online retailers. The price of the brand name product Rogaine is typically between five to $600 per year. However, if you're willing to go with a cheaper generic such as the Kirkland brand, it's significantly cheaper. Okay, so now that you have minoxidil, how do you use minoxidil? You should be applying minoxidil twice per day, once in the morning and again before bedtime. Remember, minoxidil only works if it can come into contact with your scalp, and for that reason, make sure that your scalp is dry before you apply the medication, and make sure that your scalp stays dry for at least four hours after you apply the medication. I would also recommend developing a system, a particular way in which you apply minoxidil to make sure it gets to all the places it needs to go to every single time. The way that I like to do it, I apply it in line with my hair to the side, and then I move it back about one centimeter each time. However, you should find the system that works best for you. Okay, so now that we've talked about minoxidil, let's talk about one of my all-time favorite prescription drugs, finasteride. Also known as Propecia or Proscar, finasteride is available in Canada by prescription, which means that you'll need to have a doctor's note for this one. Finasteride comes in a pill form, which you take once per day. In terms of efficacy, lots and lots of studies show that finasteride is effective both at increasing hair growth and preventing further hair loss. So it's pretty similar to minoxidil in this respect. The guidelines that I've linked looked at about 25 different finasteride studies, and they found that finasteride increased hair growth both at six, six months and at 12 months from treatment start, and this hair growth was measured both at the front of the scalp and at the vertex of the scalp. On top of that, finasteride has been demonstrated to be very sustainable. The original studies that were done by Merck demonstrated that finasteride results are sustainable for five years from treatment start. You can see very large benefits with the finasteride group when you compare it to the placebo group. And other studies extending as long as 10 years demonstrated sustained improvements in hair growth with finasteride. On top of that, results from finasteride have been demonstrated in a large proportion of men that take the medication. You can look at a study by Sato and colleagues which found that finasteride improved hair growth in 87% of men that took the medication. And another study by Yoshitaki and colleagues found that finasteride improved hair growth in 99.4% of men that used the medication and prevented further hair loss in all 100% of men that used the medication. So in terms of hair counts, I think the finasteride and minoxidil are pretty similar here. But when you start to think about long-term sustainability and the sheer proportion of men that get positive results from finasteride, I think that finasteride has the edge. Also, consider that for minoxidil to work properly, it has to be applied to all areas of the scalp that are affected. It's pretty hard to do in practice, whereas with finasteride, it's a pill and you take it once per day. You're going to be taking it the same way that everyone else has taken the pill and it's pretty hard to screw this one up. The mechanism of action of finasteride is complicated, but it's important to understand when you want to start thinking about side effects, so I'm going to go over it briefly. 5-alpha reductase is an enzyme in your body that converts testosterone to dihydrotestosterone, or DHT. Finasteride is a molecule that inhibits 5-alpha reductase and thus lowers the DHT in your body. 
Scientists first became interested in using finasteride for hair loss when they noticed that men who lacked 5-alpha reductase and by consequence had low levels of DHT never experienced male pattern hair loss. This led to the theory that DHT caused male pattern hair loss, a theory that has since been supported by many different lines of evidence. Okay, so what is DHT? Why do we need DHT? What might happen if we start to lower DHT? Let's get into this right now. DHT is what we call an androgen. That is a male sex hormone with many of the same functions as testosterone. It can help to build muscle, it can help to deepen your voice, and it can help to grow some body hair. Only about 10% of testosterone in your body is converted to DHT. However, DHT is four times more potent than testosterone. DHT is also essential for the development of external genitalia in male fetuses, which is why women of childbearing age should never handle finasteride. And if you are taking finasteride, you will not be allowed to donate blood. So when we think about DHT and some of its functions, we can kind of imagine that lowering DHT might cause some of the same effects as having low testosterone. But is this true in clinical practice or in the real world? Let's get into that right now. Side effects. Finasteride causes a couple different side effects, one of them being sexual dysfunction. This includes decreased libido, ejaculatory disorders, and erectile dysfunction. However, the frequency of these side effects might be a little bit less than you expect. For example, in clinical studies, the rates of sexual dysfunction have been reported in 2 to 6% of participants. But when you subtract the rate that's experienced by placebo, this figure is significantly less. So let's look at the original clinical studies that were done by Merck for an example. You can see in this chart over here, these are the rates of adverse events that were reported in clinical studies. You can see the difference between the placebo group and the finasteride group is about 0.5% for most of these different side effects, which essentially means that an additional one in every 200 people who took finasteride had side effects. When you compare the side effect rate to a drug like an SSRI, a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, which is an extremely safe and widely prescribed class of antidepressant, SSRIs cause sexual dysfunction in up to 50% of men that use them. When you compare the rates of sexual dysfunction from finasteride to SSRIs, they actually seem pretty good. Other side effects that are caused by finasteride, let's talk about prostate cancer. Finasteride has been studied for the purpose of reducing prostate cancer, and what scientists found is that while finasteride reduced the percent of men that got prostate cancer, the type of prostate cancer that they got was substantially more severe. However, when you look at overall survi survivability between these two groups, they're both the same, so the effect of finasteride on prostate cancer is believed to be negligible. However, this might change in the future as more, re more research becomes available, so th this is definitely a hot topic. Depression and anxiety. The majority of the clinical studies that were done on finasteride did not report depression or anxiety as major side effects. However, there was one prospective trial that did find an increase in depression that was linked to the finasteride group. So while depression might be a side effect, it's probably pretty rare post finasteride syndrome. There have been reports of men who experience prolonged sexual dysfunction, depression, um, lowered mood, brain fog, these types of symptoms, and they continue to experience these symptoms despite discontinuing finasteride. This condition has been termed post finasteride syndrome and it's extremely rare. It's so rare that many prescribers doubt that it even exists. The issue with post-finasteride syndrome is that men who do not take finasteride can also get these symptoms as well that's caused by external factors. And it's very difficult to make the connection between finasteride and post-finasteride syndrome right now. We don't know if it's caused by finasteride or it could be caused by something else. So while post-finasteride syndrome is a potential side effect, if it is a side effect, it's probably extremely rare. Okay, so are there any ways to decrease your chances of having side effects? Let's get into this right now. And I'm just going to say there's not very much evidence to support anything right now. So everything that I'm saying is purely speculation, but listen to, but just listen to what I have to say. It might be interesting. So we know that side effects correspond to the dose of finasteride. We know that men who take the five milligram tablet of finasteride have more side effects than the men who take the one milligram strength of finasteride. 
We also know there was some studies that did demonstrate that the 0.2 milligram doses of finasteride had pretty similar efficacy as the one milligram tablet of finasteride. So we could, you know, draw some kind of connection there. We could say that you could try taking a 0.2 milligram tablet of finasteride and get a lot of the benefits of finasteride without some of the side effects. But again, there's not very much evidence to support doing this. However, it's something that you can think about. So let's talk about price and availability. Finasteride price is highly variable and depends on which product that you buy. It's available as both a brand name and a generic product. I would definitely recommend going with the generic product since it is essentially the same thing for a cheaper price. But finasteride is also available as a one milligram tablet and a five milligram tablet. The five milligram tablet is for prostate enlargement, whereas the one milligram tablet is for hair loss, which is considered to be a more luxurious and cosmetic disease, whereas enlarged prostate is considered to be something a little bit more essential. For that reason, the five milligram tablet is substantially cheaper than the one milligram tablet. And one thing that you can do, one neat trick that you can do is you can get the five milligram tablet prescribed and then split it into quarters and take a quarter tablet once daily. So that's just a little way you can save some money. If you're getting the five milligram generic tablet, it's generally about 20 to $30 every three months, and that's in Canada. So how do you take finasteride? It's pretty simple. It's a pill, you take it once per day. It doesn't really matter if you take it with or without food. Just try to take it at the same time every day. Um, finasteride generally doesn't interact with too many other drugs or foods. Um, however, it's always good just to double check with your healthcare provider just to make sure there are no drug-drug interactions. Um, other than that, yeah, finasteride is pretty simple to take. Okay, so that's pretty much all I had to say about uh, hair loss right now. I just want to thank you for taking your time to watch this video. I hope it made sense for you. I hope that you were able to follow along. Um, I personally feel that hair loss is a topic that doesn't really get talked about as much as it should. And I just wanted to present some information about, you know, the bare basic treatments for hair loss. Um, in the future, I do plan to make some other videos about hair loss. We've got some really interesting things going on right now. You know, with uh, derma rolling, we've got some lasers, we've got dutasteride, obviously. There are some other effective treatments for hair loss, some supported by more evidence than others. And I'd love to make a video explaining some of these. Admittedly, I'm not a doctor. So if there's anything that I said that's wrong, please let me know in the comment section and I'd be really happy to address it. And I just want to thank you one more time for watching the video. I'll see you next time.